Hebrews chapter 13 verses 20 and 21. Amen. I'll put it on the screen for those of us today in the building. Well, that's not what I meant to do at all. There we go. Hebrews chapter 13, verses 20 and 21. And the word of the Lord from the King James text today reads, Now the God of peace, that brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus, that great shepherd of the sheep, through the blood of the everlasting covenant, make you perfect in every good work to do His will, working in you that which is well-pleasing in His sight through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. Praise the Lord. I'm going to talk to us for a while today on the topic called to be do-gooders. Amen. Called to be do-gooders. If you bow your heads with me one more time. Father, we love you. We thank you, God, for the opportunity to explore the Word of God, to benefit, oh God, today from the richness of your precepts. We ask, God, that the anointing of the Holy Ghost would rest upon the messenger of God. Help me to deliver what you've placed in my spirit. I know, God, this is a word every believer needs to hear. And every believer needs to hearken. Help us not only to hear, but to be doers of the word and not hearers only. For in so doing, we deceive only our own selves. Anoint the ear, touch the ear, and the heart of every hearer. Allow us to receive the word of God today with gladness. That it might become, that it might be the engrafted word of God. Not merely a word that passes across our hearing, but a word which becomes embedded in our soul and in our spirit. We ask it all and none other today. In Jesus' wonderful, precious name. Amen. Praise amen. God and amen. Amen. Many of us have heard the term over the years, goody two-shoes. They said, boy, there's a little goody two-shoes. And this is speaking of someone who, uh, you know, boy, I mean, you talk about virtue, you talk about doing the right thing and doing good things. It just seemed like that's all that person does. I remember in 89 or so, the year that I came out, my brother Michael, my younger brother, my second brother, uh, then I have one yet younger than him, Dallas, but my brother Michael and I were sitting in my car. We had gone somewhere and done something, and we were sitting in my car talking, and my brother said to me, and, and it was the first time he had ever said anything like this to me, so it really meant a lot to me. He said, you know, when we were in high school growing up, when we were in middle school growing up, and I was always a year behind you. He said, I've got to tell you, I was always so proud that you were my older brother. Well, I'm going to tell you, my, my brother tends to be on the competitive side. Everything's a competition. And I never heard a compliment come off his lips like this in my life. He said, I was always so proud you were my older brother. And I looked at him in pure shock, and I said, really? I said, why would you say that? He said, every time I tell somebody my name, and they heard Morrow, he said, they'd ask me, oh, are you related to that Chuck Morrow? When I was a kid, everybody called me Chuck. I prefer Charles, so those of you out there who suddenly get the idea, maybe I'll call him Chuck. You don't want to do that. <laughs> 
And uh, they said, are you related to that Chuck Morrow? And Michael said, yes, I am. He's my older brother. He said, you know, everybody I ever talked to, everybody that ever recognized I was your younger brother, you know what they'd say to me? They'd say, man, is he a goody two-shoes. Said, boy, I mean to tell you, you couldn't get that kid to do anything wrong. You couldn't pay him money to do nothing wrong. You never, I, you couldn't give him enough money to make him smoke a joint or to put a beer to his lips or to smoke a cigarette or to, you know, try to do something with a girl he ought not to be doing or a guy either one. And my brother said, you know, he said, you had a sterling reputation. Growing up, he said, everybody knew you were a good guy, that you were, con you were committed to trying to live your life in a Christian manner, and you were committed to trying to do the right thing and a good thing. And I said, really? See, I didn't know that. I, I know in high school my nickname was Rev. See, God had called me to preach when I was eight years old. And I knew I was headed for ministry, so if anybody ever asked me what I planned on doing when I grew up or when I graduated high school, I always told them I'm going to be a preacher. God called me to preach. And my nickname throughout high school was Rev. But I didn't realize the students felt about me the way they did. And my brother told me this. Well, the history of the term little Goody Two Shoes comes from a children's story which was published by John Newberry in London, England in 1765. Good heavens, two years to the year before I was born, 200 years to the year before I was born. The story popularized the phrase Goody Two Shoes as a description for an excessively virtuous person or a do-gooder. In the Apostle Paul's benediction, meaning his closing words to the Hebrew believers in his letter to the Hebrews, we call it the Hebrew epistle, he included a hope that the Lord would help make the Hebrew believers, quote, perfect, in every good work. It's often difficult for Christians to understand the role, listen carefully, of the law in the lives of New Testament believers. We know that the law was fulfilled in Christ and therefore the law is no longer binding upon the heart and upon the lives of God's people today. We don't live by the law. We live by faith in Jesus Christ. But the law still serves a purpose for the church and for the believer today. The Hebrew people most certainly wrestled with this question above their fellow Gentile believers. What role does the law now play? But the law while no longer binding upon the believer in Jesus Christ, indeed yet serves a very important function. It helps to define good and evil. It helps us to know, listen to me now, how to do good. The law never encouraged people to do evil. So if we read the law and we understand its role as a guide for good and decent conduct, we will better be able to live our lives as God would have them lived, doing good. If you were told, for instance, today that you were no longer bound by any of the laws within our nation, you could go haywire and just do whatever you please. For instance, as an example, you might drive a hundred miles an hour down a road with signs which clearly state the speed limit 
is 30 miles an hour because after all, the law is no longer binding on you. So just because that road has a 30 mile an hour speed limit, I don't have to follow that anymore. I could go 100 miles an hour. Now while you may not be subject to being stopped or ticketed for traveling far above the posted speed limit, you still might cause a wreck or accidentally kill someone because you were driving far too fast on that particular road. So it is with God's people. While the law is no longer binding upon our souls, it yet remains a very good guide toward good conduct. We might do well to still drive within the, po the posted speed limits, as those limits have been set for a reason. And that reason remains a good reason, which can prevent accidents and harm to pedestrians. Do you get what I'm trying to say today? So just because the law is no longer binding doesn't mean that the law doesn't serve a purpose and that the law doesn't offer some good information for us, help us to have good guidelines for how to conduct ourselves as God would have us conduct ourselves. The Apostle Paul said in his benediction, he said that it was his prayer that the Lord would make you perfect, meaning complete or mature, in every good work to do his will working in you that which is well-pleasing in His sight through Jesus Christ. So, we're called to be do-gooders. Amen. Mm -hmm. We're called to do good, are we not? Mm -hmm. Amen. In Leviticus 19, 15 through 18, the Word of the Lord reads, Ye shall do no unrighteousness. <laughs> In judgment, Sorry. thou shalt not respect the person of the poor, nor honor the person of the mighty, but in righteousness shalt thou judge thy neighbor. Thou shalt not go up and down as a talebearer among thy people, neither shalt thou stand against the blood of of thy neighbor. I am the Lord. Thou shalt not hate thy brother in thine heart. Thou shalt in any wise rebuke thy neighbor and not suffer sin upon him. Thou shalt not avenge nor bear any grudge against the children of thy people, but thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. I am the Lord. Folks, I got news for you. That passage gives some awful good advice. Amen. That passage gives some awful good uh, instruction and direction on how to do good. Now, the law is no longer binding upon us as a law, but it still serves as good uh, guideposts for living a good life and pleasing the Lord and doing His will in our lives. Am I telling the truth today? Amen. In Micah chapter 6 and verse 8, the word of the Lord declares, He hath showed thee, O man, what is good, and what doth the Lord require of thee, but to do justly and to love mercy <coughs> and to walk humbly with thy God. In Romans chapter 3 and verse 10 through 12, the word of the Lord reads, As it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. There is none that understandeth. There is none that seeketh after God. They are all gone out of the way. They are together become unprofitable. Listen, there is none that doeth good. No, not one. My Lord, have mercy. God has called us to be do-gooders. God has called us to live our lives in such a way as to do good.
The problem with a lot of Christians in the church today is we live our lives based on this notion of thou shalt not, thou shalt not, thou shalt not. So we're constantly trying to respond and react to things in a way that, uh, that we're supposed to react. But we're not called to be re, uh, a people of reaction. We're not called to react to things, listen to me children, in the right way. We are called to act right. See, we're always thinking about, as a child of God, we're always looking at things in terms of how we respond to things and how we react to things. Oh, I've got to be, I've got to react to this as a Christian. I've got to respond to this thing the way that a Christian is supposed to respond. But what we don't think about is the fact that God has called us to be do-gooders. What does that mean? It means in a proactive sense, God has called us to do good which has nothing in the world to do with how we react oh my goodness I hope you're hearing me today but rather proactively how we act there are so many Christians in the world today that have so many opportunities to do good and yet we let those opportunities pass us by because we don't think of our walk with God in terms of doing good. We think of our walk with God in terms of reacting right. Hello now. Instead of proactively doing good. I've told Tommy on many occasions He's come home from work and said to me, one of the ladies at my job lost her husband. He was uh, had you know cancer. He had this illness or that illness, and he died. And so she's going to be off for a few days and blah, blah. And I'll say to him, well, are you going to go to the wake or are you going to go to the funeral? Are you going to go to the funeral home and at least sign your name in the guest book and let her know you care and that you were there? He says, well, no, I wasn't planning on it. I'm embarrassing him right now. I said, honey, here's an opportunity for you to do good. Do you follow what I'm saying? It's not about reacting to anything. No, here's an opportunity for you to do good. Here is an opportunity for you proactively to do something, to act like a child of God. We've been called to be do-gooders. Hello now. Have we not been called to do good, haven't we? And in doing good, do we not please the Lord? In doing good, do we not make heaven happy? So therefore, here's an opportunity for you to do good. Here's an opportunity for you to be a blessing to somebody. Here's an opportunity for you to be an encouragement to somebody. Here's an opportunity for you to be a testimony to somebody. How many Christians think in these terms? Well, I'll tell you, based on my experience, too few. And every day, opportunity after opportunity after opportunity after opportunity passes us by, and we had opportunity over and over again to do good, but we didn't do it. Again, I want to reiterate, I want to keep driving this point home. I'm not talking about how you react. I'm not talking about how you respond. I'm not talking about even how uh, a poor person, someone uh, on the street, someone living uh, homeless, and they come to you and ask you for something and whether or not you give to them, that's a reaction. I'm not even talking about that. I'm talking about living our lives as God's people proactively thinking in terms of doing good. Therefore, I go to McDonald's sometimes, or I'll go to certain places, and there may be someone sitting at a table who is obviously, to me, homeless. Their dress is filthy, their they, they look terrible and they've got packages with them, you know, that they're carrying around. And they're obviously homeless. This person does not approach me. This person doesn't ask me for anything. But when I go up to make my order, I order and I ask the gal behind the counter, do you sell gift cards? Yes, I do. Give me a $10 gift card. 
And then I take my food, I'm going out to the truck, and I go by that table and I say to this person here, I put $10 on this for you so you can get some of the for a time or two. Do you follow what I'm telling you? I'm doing good. I don't need, I'm not reacting to a request for help. No, I'm living as a child of God. I'm thinking proactively in terms of being a do-gooder. God's called us to be do-gooders. My God, how different the world would be if God's people were do-gooders. Am I telling the truth? How different the church would be if God's people were do-gooders. We've had, and I'm going to tell you, uh, you know, I give a lot of honor and a lot of credit to my grandfather, bless his heart. He had a lot of issues in his life. But I'm going to tell you, as far as being a do-gooder, I don't know very many people outside of my granddad that, that were as big a do-gooder as he was. My grandfather did a lot of good for a lot of people. When his neighbors needed help, he went up there to help him. And I mean, uh, one of our, one of my family's neighbors for many, 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 many years, her husband was drunk. He had a problem with alcohol, real bad problem. Man had accident after accident in his car, broke his back on a number of occasions. This way back in the day, before you know, drunk driving even was pursued legally, you know. And uh, he eventually wound up paralyzed from the waist down in a wheelchair because of all the accidents he had had, you know, over the years uh, from drunk driving and what have you. Thank God he found the Lord before he uh, died. For a matter of fact, for many, many years before he died, he was living for the Lord. But anyway, back in the day when he was a terrible raging alcoholic and and you know wasn't functioning well wasn't treating his wife and kids quite the way he should have and you know and doing things he shouldn't have been doing and I'm not going to go into all the details but my grandmother would tell my grandfather I was talking to this lady, I'm not going to use their names, but it, you know, I was talking to this neighbor today, and bless her heart, she told me that their water heater busted, and she's trying to find a way to hire a repairman to come up and to fix their water heater. And my grandfather would look at my grandmother and say, give her a call and tell her I'm coming up. Now my grandfather had just come off a 16-hour work shift. And he said, call her up and tell her I'm coming up the hill. I'm going to come fix the water heater for her. He knew her husband, you know, couldn't, didn't do these kind of things. And, could, you know, and he knew she couldn't afford to hire a repairman to do it. And this lady herself told me, she said, you have no idea how many times your grandfather came to our aid and to our rescue. You have no many times. And I didn't even have to ask him. If he knew the need was there, he immediately responded to the... Do you follow what I'm telling you today? See, it wasn't about responding to a request for help. It was about seeing an opportunity to do good. And doing it. I'll tell you, a lot of people are going to stand before God in the judgment. And the day is coming, folks, when you're doing good and you're doing wrong and evil are going to be balanced out and they're going to be weighed. And there's going to be quite a contrast in a lot of Christians' lives because uh, our human nature has us doing the wrong thing all the time. But how often do we balance that out on the other side of the equation by doing good? The opportunities are there. They're in front of us every day. But how many of us either ignore those opportunities or we simply let them pass by? In 1 Timothy 6 verses 17 through 19, the word of the Lord reads, Paul to Timothy writing, Charge them that are rich in this world that they be not high-minded, nor trust in uncertain riches, but in the living God, who giveth us richly all things to enjoy. Listen, that they do good, that they be rich in good works, 
ready to distribute, willing to communicate, laying up in store for themselves a good foundation against the time to come, that they may lay hold on eternal life. Paul said, you tell the rich that they ought to be mindful to do good. Amen. What does that mean? That means being proactive, living your life as a child of God, uh, seeing and looking for opportunities to do good and doing it. Am I telling the truth? Why? Because every good thing I do, I'm helping to kind of counterbalance all the negativity that my human nature brings to the equation. When I stand before God in the judgment, I want to have some good on this side to counteract just my pure human nature on the other side. Am I telling the truth? I'm not saying you're going to wind up in hell if one outweighs the other. Or you're going to get into heaven because one outweighs the other. No, heaven isn't determined by that, but your reward is. Oh my Lord, did you hear what I said today? Heaven is not determined by whether your good outweighs your bad. No, heaven is determined by whether or not you have heard and believed and obeyed the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's how you determine your eternal salvation. But our reward... Jesus said, when I come, he said, my reward is coming with me to reward every man, listen, according to what? His works. Tommy will tell you, I've got certain habits that I have had for many, many, many years. I grew up with an unsafe father who was hell on wheels. I, I can't tell you folks, honestly, I, I can't even begin to tell you what it was like growing up under this man. He was a narcissistic devil, just horrible, horrible to, to deal with. Negative, critical, nasty, condemnatory, judgmental of everybody and everything. And I mean, you couldn't do right by him. I don't care what you did or how you did it. You could be the best of the best of the best at what you do. And my father still, still, I guarantee you, would find something to criticize. He would still find something so that he could bring accusation against you. He loved tearing people down. He loved tearing things down. He made sport of tearing his children down and tearing his wife down. Psychologically, it was torture growing up in this fire. You wonder why I can't stand Donald Trump? Honey, I grew up with Donald Trump. Every time I see Donald Trump, the man makes me want to vomit because his personality, his character, reminds me so much of what I grew up with that it, 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 I can't even explain it. When you have lived with a narcissist, you know how horrible and detrimental, and, and they poison everything and everyone around them. If you get into their atmosphere, if you get into their orbit, they're going to poison you. They're going to destroy you. Well, I'm his son. God called me to preach when I was eight years old. I got news for you, honey. You try living a Christian life. You try growing up a Christian in a home with a man like this. And you talk about a battle between good and evil. My father used to constantly come against our faith. He used to constantly come against uh, uh, the notion of God. Constantly. My faith, my walk with God was under attack every stinking minute of my life. I didn't go to school with somebody who attacked it. I lived with somebody who attacked it. A lot of that garbage rubbed off on me. Unbeknownst to me, you know, obviously you're a kid. You emulate what you see. You know, you tend to act the way. Well, when I was a preteen, probably about, I, I think maybe around... 11, 12, 13, somewhere around there. 
One of my fellow church members, a young lady, a girl that I've always admired, and she may even be watching today, Barbara. I love Barbara. She's an incredible girl. I love her to death. Went to church with her, grown up as a kid, a wonderful girl. And Barbara come to me and told me about something in town that they were putting in a new skate rink in town, you know, and she was so excited because us young people at the church, every once in a while, they'd have a skating party, you know, we'd all go to the roller skating rink and blah, blah, blah. And just like my dad, I responded with nothing but negativity and bile and then, and I responded, you know, well, you know what comes with places like that, it, the kids hang out and it turns into a, 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 a violence, it turns into a place with drugs and blah, blah, you know, and I just started spewing all this crap because that's how my father reacted to everything. And I had learned that behavior and of course I'm just a kid so I'm not aware of it, I'm, you know. Well one of my mother's brothers, my uncle, was standing nearby. And after Barbara left, kind of dejected and kind of, you know, like this, you know, my Uncle Stephen come over to me and he said, doggone it. That was his favorite phrase. Doggone it. He said, doggone it, Chuck. No wonder you don't have more friends. No wonder you know, Papa. He said, you sound just like your father. Said all Barbara said was thus and so. And boy, you hit her right between the eyes with negativity and condemnation and garbage. And my uncle, I'm gonna tell you, out of all my mother's brothers, I loved Stephen pretty well, but he wasn't my favorite uncle, to be frank. And him telling me this, I I would have much preferred it had been a different uncle telling me this than Stephen, to be honest with you. But you know, even as a kid, I had enough humility in me because I knew God needed me to be humble. I had enough humility in me that when I went home, all I could do was think about what my Uncle Stephen had told me. I kept thinking about it. I kept thinking about it. I said, oh God, oh Lord Jesus. Because I knew my father was a, a hell on wheels, you know. And the thought that I was acting anything like my father scared me to death. And I thought about what Stephen told me. And I began to pray. And I said, oh God, Lord, if, if, I'm, if I've inherited my father's traits, if I'm acting like my dad, if I've learned to act like him, then oh Jesus, I need you to take this out of me. I need you to remove it from me, God. I can't have this in my life. This is not the way for a child of God to conduct themselves. I need you to take it from me. And as sure as I'm standing in front of you today, the Holy Ghost spoke to me as clear as a bell and said to me, I can't remove it. But I can replace it. I said, what? The Lord said, if you try to stop doing that, if you try, every time you talk to somebody, if you sit there and you try to police yourself and monitor yourself so you don't react that way, you will drive yourself insane. He said, but this is what you need to do. And folks, I'm not kidding you. Uh, if you walk in relationship with God, if you learn this thing the way you ought to learn this thing, then I'm here to tell you today, you will hear from the Lord as clear as somebody sitting next to you talking to you. And the Lord said to me, He said, you can't just try not to do this because if you do that, you'll drive yourself crazy. So what you need to do, instead of trying to undo that behavior, you need to replace it with something positive. What I tell you to do is this. Look at every person you see, everybody in your field of vision, and find something positive to say about that person. And then, say it to them. I'm like, what? The Lord said, 
You see a lady standing in front of you at the grocery line and she's wearing a pretty dress. She may be the ugliest lady you've ever laid eyes on. Her hair may be the worst hairdo you've ever seen. Her makeup may be that of Bozo the Clown. She may look terrible in every possible way. And if you reacted to that the way your father would, you'd start criticizing and judging and finding fault. He said, but here's what you do instead. If you want to stop doing it that way, you need to replace it with something positive. Positive. So look at her and find something. I don't care if it's a color in her dress. If it's one color out of 30 colors, you find something you can compliment. And then, important, speak it. Don't just think it. Speak it. You've got to put it into words because the negativity will pour out of you like water. So now you need to let positivity pour out of you like water. Do you follow? By doing that, you will help to reduce you're doing the other. Because my father would sit and, you know, people be coming out of the grocery stores and he'd just be picking them apart one by one. Boy, she looks like a, he looks like this. Anyway, you know, just, just picking people to death. So this is what the Holy Ghost told me to do. So as a young person, I began to do this. I'd go to church and I'd see uh, the girl wearing a dress and it might be a pretty dress and I'd say, Barbara, that's a pretty dress. I like that dress. Or, you know, John, I like your shirt. That's a nice shirt. I sure do like the color of that tie. I may hate the tie, but I like the color of the tie. Do you follow what I'm saying? And I would begin to compliment. I'd begin to speak positive things. Well, over the years, that has morphed and Tommy can tell you if I'm telling a lie, I constantly, constantly, constantly am complimenting people today, am I not? Yep. Constantly. I walk into a grocery store, I walk into uh, Walmart, I walk into Sam's Club, and I'll be walking down the aisle and I'll say, oh, you've got the prettiest family. What a nice looking family you have. What a beautiful, I love me some babies. What a beautiful baby. I love the color in your shirt. I love that. I love, and I mean, literally, as I'm walking down the aisle and, and, and walking through the store, I'm literally just complimenting people and speaking compliments and speaking you know why people because we've been called to do good everything I see that I can speak positive of is an opportunity for me to do something good do you know how many people I may have I don't know I may have made their day a whole lot brighter Tommy will tell you how many times I'll say to somebody, you know, it may be a gal, and bless her heart, she may be on the hefty side, you know. She may be awful big, and she may not be used to getting a whole lot of compliments. But all I'll have to say is, you know, i got to tell you, I love your dress. I love the pattern and the fabric, and it's so pretty. And boy, they light up, don't they? Or I'll say, I'll say, oh, I love your hair. You know, I love the way these uh, African American gals and fellas can wear their hair. I mean, there are things that African American folks can do with their hair that we white folks just don't have that much, you know, flexibility to do all these things. And Tommy, I tell you, I, I'm constantly telling these beautiful black girls, you know, oh, I love your hair, girl, that is pretty, that looks so nice on you, don't I? And I'm doing this all the time. And you know, every once in a while, I run into somebody that, by God, they're going to give me a snarky attitude, they're going to give me a snarky reaction. But for the most part, People smile big and say, oh, thank you, and oh, thank you. It, it, it makes their day, it brings a little bit of brightness to an otherwise dark day. And you know, I'm taking the opportunity to do good. Do you follow what I'm telling you? I've told Tommy ever since he and I met, I said, you know, I've come to realize that what God was speaking to me was, you have an opportunity in a negative world full of negativity. People don't think anything, anything of speaking disparaging words, speaking, uh, you know, negative things, insults. Look at Facebook. Look at the, the Internet. Man, people are ten times faster to say something nasty than they are to say something nice, right? Yeah. 
And I've told Tommy, I said, what I feel like God showed me as a teenager is you have an opportunity to sow positivity into the atmosphere. You has you have an opportunity to speak positivity, positive energy as it were, into the atmosphere to help counter all that negativity. That one kind word you speak may be the only kind word that person hears all day. They may work a job and they may have to listen to people gripe and groan about them all day and all night long. Or gripe and groan about something. They may be a work in the window at a fast food restaurant drive through And I come through and if they listen to me when I give my order and I don't have to repeat myself a dozen times and if I don't have to tell them five times what I'm ordering and they listen and they're attentive and they take my order and they say thank you, drive, pull through. When I get to the window, first thing I say to them is, Honey, I want to tell you, you did your job wonderfully. You did a wonderful job. I love when people are professional and when they listen and I don't have to repeat my order a dozen times and all. I said, boy, I love that. And you did a great job. And boy, I'm going to tell you, you'd be surprised how many people I've said that to. And boy, I mean, they beam. They just beam. They're so thrilled to get a compliment. Because I guarantee if somebody got something negative to say, they're going to say it. If their french fries aren't hot enough, they're going to come at that person as if that person purposely gave them cold fries. You know what I'm talking about? But we have the opportunity every day to do good. There are opportunities in front of us that we miss every single hour. In Hebrews 13 and verse 16, the Apostle Paul wrote, But to do good and to communicate, forget not, for with such sacrifices, that means effort, it takes effort to do these things. God is well pleased. And I want to tell you a little secret. For those of you who believe that the Word of God only tells us in one place that we're supposed to be faithful to the house of God and we're supposed to be part of a fellowship and part of a church. Uh, for those of you that believe there's only one verse in the whole New Testament that tells me that I'm supposed to go to church and be faithful. Uh-uh, honey, you're wrong. In this passage that I just read to you, Hebrews 13, 16, the Apostle Paul said, listen, but to do good and to communicate, forget not. The word communicate, translated in the King James, is a word koinonia in Greek, which means to fellowship, associate, community, communion, joint participation. <laughs> so every time you read the word communicate in the New Testament, and it's there quite a bit, it's actually talking about don't forget to be part of, to make yourself part of the whole, to make yourself part of the fellowship, to make yourself part of the community, to participate in the community. Do you follow what I'm telling you now? If you remember when Paul wrote to Timothy concerning the rich, listen, he said, charge them that are rich in this world that they be not high-minded nor trust in uncertain riches, but in the living God who giveth us richly all things to enjoy. That they do good, that they be rich in good works, ready to distribute, listen, willing to communicate. So what Paul was saying was just because you got money, 
Just because you're rich doesn't mean that you can sit out, oh, well, I don't want to be part of the church because there's a bunch of poor people there. I, I don't want to go to that fellowship because there's going to be a bunch of poor people bringing their dishes. And, you know, I, I'd rather go to a five-star restaurant. No, no, no. If you're a child of God, part of doing good, hello now, is communicating, making yourself part of the community, being part of the fellowship, being part of the body of Christ. Do you hear what I'm telling you now? That's part of being good. That's part of doing good. When you have the opportunity to go to church and be part of the fellowship, when you have the opportunity to bring your faith to the house of God, because somebody there may need your faith to work on their behalf. They may need you to help them pray through to the Holy Ghost. They may need you to help them pray through to victory. They may need you to help pray them through to deliverance. They may need you to help pray them through to a healing. My God, it isn't always about what you get out. It's about what you bring to it. That's right. Amazes me how many Christian people I'm talking about doing good, being a do-gooder. Every time you go to the house of God, honey, you've just been handed a platter of opportunities to do good. Am I telling the truth? Well, you've just been given an opportunity to pass all kinds of compliments, to speak all kinds of kind words. You've been given an opportunity to encourage one another. You've been given opportunities to be a blessing to one another. You've been given an opportunity to pray with people. You've been given an opportunity to believe God with people for miracles and for blessings and for things they need. My God have mercy. Only an idiot would pass up on the opportunity to go to the house of God because every Sunday every time the people of God gather there's a bundle of opportunities handed to you to do good mm -hmm. Whew. I told you just because this is good old fashioned instruction on how to live right don't mean it's not a positive and uplifting and encouraging word in Hebrews 10.25 the apostle Paul said not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is but exhorting one another and so much the more as ye see the day approaching. Do you see right there, there's an opportunity to do good. Exhorting one another. Encouraging one another. Uplifting one another. Oh my God, have mercy. I'm going to tell you, you don't know how much you miss the benefits of God's house and God's people and the fellowship of the church until you don't have it. One of the things that disgusts me about the response of people in Dallas, Texas to our ministry, it's, it's not because I'm going to get any big jolly out of having 100 people or 200 people or 500 people sitting in the church. The number doesn't mean squat to me, folks. Took me a while to get here, but I've gotten here. The number doesn't mean anything. It's not about the number. I'm not trying to gain glory for myself or praise for myself. That's not it. No, there are benefits to having a group of God's people coming together. There are benefits in worship. There are benefits in prayer. There are benefits in faith. There are benefits in spirit. And I miss those things. Because we don't have anybody bringing them into the room and contributing them to our services with us. In Luke 6, 27 through 35, trying to hurry. But I say unto you which hear, Jesus speaking, love your enemies. Do good to them which hate you. Bless them that curse you. And pray for them which despitefully use you. Do you see here? Do you see here the opportunity to do good? Do you see the opportunity to be a do-gooder? Everything the Lord's saying here is respond to everything with good. Do good to them which hate you. Bless them that curse you. Pray for them which despitefully use you. And unto him that smiteth thee on the one cheek offer also the other. And him that taketh away thy cloak 
forbid not to take thy coat also. Give to every man that asketh thee, and of him that taketh away thy goods, ask them not again. And as ye would that men should do to you, do ye also to them likewise. For if ye love them which love you, what thank have ye? For sinners also love those that love them. And if ye do good to them which do good to you, what thank have ye? For sinners also do even the same. And if ye lend to them of whom ye hope to receive, what thank have ye? For sinners also lend to sinners to receive as much again. But love your enemies and do good and lend, hoping for nothing again. And your reward shall be great. And ye shall be the children of the highest. For he is kind unto the unthankful and to the evil. In John chapter 5 verses 28 and 29. Marvel not at this for the hour is coming. In the which all that are in the graves shall hear his voice. And shall come forth they that have done good unto the resurrection of life and they that have done evil unto the resurrection of damnation. Now mind you, he is not saying that those who have done good have earned the resurrection unto life, and those who have done evil have earned... No, no, no. He's saying that if you're a child of God, you're called to be a do-gooder. Therefore, the do-gooders are going to be called to the resurrection of life. Am I telling the truth? And those who have not done good to the, to the resurrection of, the, of damnation. Finally, this afternoon, in 2 Corinthians 5, verse 10, For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that everyone may receive the things done in his body, according to that he hath done whether it be good or bad. Children, we've been called to be do-gooders. God has called us not merely to react and to respond to things in a godly manner, in a Christ-like way, in a biblical manner. No, no, no. No, we're supposed to be proactive. We're supposed to be doing good and seeing the opportunity to do good and taking advantage of that opportunity. Oh, if God's people live this way, think about it for a minute. Think about it for a minute. I had a fellow, and I'm trying to close, I had a fellow in our church a while back. He was telling me how that their pickup truck was having trouble and they realized it was the, I want to say the alternator. And he said, we don't have the money right now to fix it. He said, but we figured out it was, I think it was the alternator. And uh, so I thought about it for a minute. Now, I didn't have the money to, to buy him a new alternator. And I don't, you know, you, you can't be unwise. You can't be foolish in how you do things. But... I thought about it for a minute. I said, you know what? I can put this on a credit card and I can pay it out over a period of time, you know, so it, it, you know, it'll cost me a little bit of interest, but I can help this man. So I said to him, I said, let's go to, let's go to O'Reilly's. So we went down to O'Reilly's. I said, I'm going to get you a new alternator. The man at O'Reilly's said, uh, well, which one does your truck take? Because there's two different ones that fit on this year model or whatever. He said, you know, uh, it, it, one has this and the other one has that. And, blah, blah, blah. and he said, I, I don't know. I really don't know which it takes. I said, well, I'll tell you what. Let's buy them both. You take them to the house. You figure out which one goes on your truck. Put it on. And then we'll bring the other one back and get credit for it after a while. Folks... God is my witness. I'm so far from perfect, I can't even see perfect from where I live. But I do know how to strive to be a do-gooder. 
I do know that as a child of God, we've been called to be do-gooders. And when an opportunity presents itself, when somebody says to me, Brother, help us pray. I need to find a new bed for my house. Uh, we just moved into an apartment. We had a young, uh, a young lady in our church. Her parents uh, attended our church, and this young lady moved into her own place. And her mother said, um, we're trying to help them find some furniture. And so I said, what do they need? She told me, I said, I can give you this. I got this. I got this. I got this. And but didn't I? said, well, they need something to eat on in the living room. I didn't have the table and chairs for the living room, so I went to Walmart and bought a card table and four folding chairs, didn't I? Amen. I said, hey, we can meet this need. There's a way for me to help fit me, meet this need. Folks, there's opportunity all around us every day to do good. As the people of God, we've been called to be goody two-shoes. We've been called to be do-gooders. Not just about how we react, but it's also about being proactive, looking for, recognizing opportunities to do good. So when we stand before God in the judgment, the Lord might look at me and say, you know, Charles, <laughs> bless your heart, you were as imperfect a human being as any I ever created. But my goodness, you did a lot of good. Am I telling the truth? Wouldn't you love the Lord to be able to look at you and say, for all your faults, for all your warts, for all your sin, for all your weakness, you sure did do a lot of good. You understood the principle of God's people being do-gooders. And you took every opportunity that was handed you, and you did good. Well done. My good and faithful servant. Hallelujah. I don't know about you, but those are the words I want to hear one day. Amen. Would you stand with me this afternoon? Call.